Pastor again. So our next speaker is Tal Moran from uh, IDC. And before we start with the talk, uh, I need the back row quickly. You need to help me check if the microphone is actually working. Okay, can you hear me in the back row? Not at all. Okay. Uh, I mean, okay. just speak a bit more uh, louder. I'll, I'll speak a bit louder. Okay. And otherwise, back <coughs> row, you need to complain if it's not uh, or, loud Or enough. you can come down. There are like three rows uh, right here. Yeah, we have space. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, hi, everyone. Um, so I'm going to talk about the adventures of the tortoise and the hare in space-time. This is uh, joint work with uh, Ido Bentov and Julian Loss. And... Uh, And uh, this is uh, actually the Space Mesh Protocol, so there's a company that uh, is implementing this. Um, but I'm not going to talk about that. I'll talk about the protocol itself. So I'm actually going to start with a summary of everything for everybody who plans to fall asleep. You know, it's early in the morning. and So you can fall asleep right after the next slide. Um, so, so what are the problems um, that we have with uh, current blockchain protocols? Well, one problem, uh, maybe the, the most difficult problem, is low throughput. So uh, right now, uh, Bitcoin has something like seven transactions per second. This is not enough if we want to have a really global economy based on uh, cryptocurrencies. And some of this low throughput is you know, choices made by Bitcoin, by specific parameters, but some of it is uh, inherent. There are these inherent uh, limits on block frequency and block size because of the way the protocol works. Um, there's a problem with centralization. So the, the basic reason we want to use cryptocurrencies is to distribute trust. Right? Our, our security depends on the fact that uh, you know, we have many, many people and we can assume an uh, honest majority, something like that, but if there are only five people controlling the entire uh, cryptocurrency, this assumption breaks down, right? So current uh, protocols have this sort of high barrier to participation, which uh, causes uh, high centralization. And then there are also incentive compatibility problems, um, right? So said, can we trust that there's an um, honest majority if there are uh, very few people? That's one problem. But the other problem, even if it is super decentralized, um, why, why is it reasonable to assume that the majority are honest? It's more reasonable to assume that the majority are rational. Right? So if this protocol is not incentive compatible, if it's actually rational to do something that the protocol says you shouldn't do, then our assumption about honest majority uh, will likely break down. And finally, there's this very, very high cost of protocols that are based on uh, proofs of work, right? uh, which we would like to somehow solve. So. Uh, oh, and, and one thing that uh, Jan mentioned, I think he was, like, his talk was uh, really a, a great introduction to the problems that uh, we're trying to solve. So uh, what about security? So there are actually uh, some other protocols that try to solve these problems different ways, but there are very few of them that really manage to show that they're secure. And again, I, I think I don't have to say much more about this. If we don't prove that they're secure, then it's very hard to be convinced because these are very complex systems. OK, so what, how are we trying to solve these problems? Well, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to replace this chain structure in the blockchain with what we call a mesh, basically a layered DAG. And this will help us by removing many of the scaling limitations. So it lets us uh, have you know, many more transactions uh, per second. Second, uh, the, one of the properties of this uh, protocol is that it's going to be much easier to prove that it's incentive compatible. Um, this I'm not going to talk about very much, but I think uh, Pavel is going to uh, talk about it a little bit more, about the uh, uh, protocol that we're based on called uh, MeshCash. And then we're going to take this proof of work, and we're going to replace it with proof of space-time. I'll explain what that is, but basically what we mean is using disk storage instead of uh, using CPU work. And this means the amortized energy costs can be very, very low. 
And finally, uh, again, because of the protocol structure, um, and because mar uh, the miners, the home miners, have a uh, very low marginal cost, our, our idea is that you already have a disk at home. So if you're buying a disk, maybe you can't compete with economies of scale. But if you already have a disk for a different purpose, then your marginal cost is very low. Um, this basically makes it much easier to uh, overcome this high centralization. And of course, all of this uh, comes with a security proof. Um, so we can reduce the security of the protocol to some much uh, you know, more convincing and, and simpler assumptions. OK, so that was the, the summary. Now uh, you know, feel free to nod off. Um, I'll start with a very brief um, you know, overview of the current protocols or what's a cryptocurrency, even though we've already seen this, just so uh, you know, see from the angle that uh, we're coming at here. So what's a cryptocurrency? It's based on a distributed consensus, right? Everybody has to agree on the current state of the world, where the money is. And the state has to evolve according to uh, pre-agreed rules. And for example, one of these rules has to be that history is irreversible, right? If I sent somebody some money, then I can't say tomorrow that I didn't send some money. And finally, there are also incentive mechanisms that allow this cryptocurrency to work in a distributed setting with rational actors. So there is some way to, to cause people to join the system and to uh, hopefully incentivize them to do the right thing. But of course, you all know consensus is a very hard problem. And this is a, like a classic problem from the uh, 70s, um, which of course is still studied today. And th the main challenge is when, you have, uh, when you're trying to do a consensus in this setting, then you don't know who to trust, right? Somebody could be malicious, but you don't know who. And because of this, basically permissionless consensus is impossible. Right? We can't get a, a consensus without uh, knowing who the parties are. And the reason is that you can have you know, multiple Sybil identities. Um, so we need an honest majority for consensus. If you have Sybil identities, you cannot guarantee an honest majority, so it's impossible. But what did uh, sort of Nakamoto figure out? What I, I think the, the you know, big breakthrough that allowed us to get things like Bitcoin is that we can, instead of counting people, we can count resources. Um, and these resources should be easy to measure, but hard to fake. And now, instead of our assumption about an honest majority of parties, we'll have an assumption about an honest majority of resources. Um, and then, once we have this assumption, how do we build uh, a consensus protocol? So this is the, the sort of very, very high-level uh, blockchain idea, is we're going to have a lottery, and we're going to elect some random leader. This is basically what uh, Jan showed. Um, and our probability to be elected depends on you know, how much resource we have relative to everybody else. And now the leader gets to determine the next block. And because uh, this lottery has sort of this low probability of winning, most of the time there's only one leader that's elected. And when there's only one leader, it's easy to get consensus. So we all agree this is the leader. Um, but sometimes uh, there could be multiple leaders elected at the same time. And if multiple leaders are elected at the same time, then we have a race. So uh, what happens then? Well, it's a chain, so we can only select one. So we have to somehow resolve this. One will win, and one will lose. OK, so why is that not a good thing? What, what are the problems with races? Well, the races are time sensitive. Um, this is especially true of the way we resolve things in uh, Bitcoin, for example. Um, like the first block to be published has a higher probability of winning the race, which means there's actually a very high cost if your block gets larger. Because the larger the block is, the longer it takes to transmit it. And this leads to perverse incentives. right? Because sometimes, because of the way these races work, it's better to not publish a block at all so that you get a head start for the next block. And again, this, this causes a breakdown in incentive compatibility. And it also causes, even if we forget this uh, problem with you know, dishonest behavior, if everybody just behaves honestly, you just get automatically a head start on the next block because you know it before you publish it. Everybody else has to wait for it, which means that the distribution of rewards also is unfair. So the rich get richer. Well, the rich will always get richer, but here they get richer 
even more than they deserve. <laughs> okay, uh, so that was one problem, right, with these races. What about proofs of work? Why are they problematic? Well, computational power is very expensive and it's limited, so limited is good because we're basing on it, but because a computational power has huge uh, environmental costs, right, then uh, we have these systems that are inherently sort of environmentally unfriendly, right? We, when we have a proof of work based system, we can't say, oh, well, let's just get a more efficient proof of work, because the whole point is everybody has to work as fast as they can, otherwise our honest majority function um, yeah, our majority assumption doesn't hold. Um, and also, th this could cause higher mining costs because we have to somehow reimburse miners for all these uh, expenses. So, so proofs of work are bad, and I think by now almost everybody agrees that proofs of work are bad. And so, okay, so what can we do instead of proofs of work? Well, one thing that's uh, pretty popular today is to use money. You say instead of uh, using work, we'll use something that is also limited, um, which is you know, money. You could use money to buy CPU, but instead of buying CPU, just use the money directly. And this is very, very cheap. It's excellent in terms of environmental costs, because you only need signatures, basically, uh, to use money. Uh, we'll talk about why it's not so good in a bit. Um, and a second uh, thing, this is what we're going to use, is storage. So again, storage also limited. We're calling uh, this proofs of space time, for those of you uh, who are familiar with proofs of space. Um, this is basically the same thing up to you know, some technical definitions, but it's the right definition. Um, we're, keeping <laughs> we're, we're keeping the disk full for a period of time, hence uh, space uh, time. Um, and this is uh, much cheaper than proofs of work, but it's actually not quite as cheap as proofs of state, because there's a real resource, and it turns out you also have to use a little bit of work uh, to initialize here, so uh, there is some cost to it, but it's still cheaper. So, okay, so we have proofs of stake that seem just better, right? They're cheaper, they're just signatures. Why, why should we not just use proofs of stake for everything? Well, the problem, one problem is that they're, in some sense, too cheap. Uh, what does it mean? It means that we can always simulate our past without any cost. And this is a problem if we want to uh, resolve sort of what is the right history, right? If we wake up and we want to say which, which history is correct, and somebody can simulate an entire history with zero cost, it's a problem, which means that when we want to prove security uh, for a proof of stake protocol, we need some additional assumptions. And uh, these assumptions might be less reasonable. For example, things like uh, secure erasures, right? So erasing data securely um, is, is a nice assumption. It helps you do these things with proofs of stake, but in real life, it's not clear how you can force people to securely erase data and whether, uh, you know, it's, it, 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 we know that it's hard. It's hard to actually securely erase data. Um, the second thing is that proofs of stake are not quite permissionless. So they're definitely decentralized, but you do need permission because the owners of the current stake have to sell you the stake, right? You can't just join the system uh, however you like. And you say, fine, you'll always find somebody to sell you stake, so that shouldn't be a problem. But in fact, this is a problem. For example, suppose that uh, some adversary manages to capture at some point 51% of the stake. Now this adversary can control a majority of the resource, and they can just refuse to, uh, to sell to anybody. Right? And you can't even detect this, because they can pretend to sell to, to themselves. Right? So you see things uh, moving, but the adversary controls 51% of the stake, and they'll control it from now forever. And you know, maybe if the system is worth you know, $50 trillion, it might not be reasonable to, to assume that an adversary can control 51% of the stake, but all these systems start out small. So if somebody um, tries to capture, say the system is worth only $1 million now, somebody captures 51% of the stake, and now they just wait. They wait until it's worth $50 trillion, and now they have 51% of the stake, and there's sort of nothing you can do. So this is a, a pretty bad thing. Um, there's also this problem with the, in current systems, they're based on proof of stake, there's a high minimum stake to reduce uh, various costs. So uh, this means it's actually pretty hard to join. Even if you know, somebody's willing to sell you, you, you still need to have you know, the equivalent of $1,000 worth uh, to just join the system, which makes it less decentralized. 
And there's also this sort of circularity problem, um, right? Because the security of the system depends on the fact that the money has value, but the money only has value if the system is secure. And so, you know, it's not for nothing that, you know, one of the uh, more famous protocols is called Ouroboros, right? There is this circularity problem you have to resolve somehow. Okay, so those were the problems. Um, when we design a solution, there's like the solution space is gigantic. So what I'm going to describe is sort of the guiding principles, how we chose uh, to focus on this solution space. So the first thing is, uh, this is usual in cryptography, we want to overestimate the adversary. And in particular, we want to assume a malicious adversary and not a rational one, which uh, some systems do. Um, we want to assume that the adversary can attack all the time. So there, there is no requirement for a period you know, to, to get things moving for liveness, for example, where you know, the adversary just stops. Um, because in real life, you know, the internet is always under some kind of attack. It might not always be you know, a very high level of attack, but assuming like there's nothing is, is too strong. Um, and we're going to assume that the adversary has uh, full control over the message timing. Um, which means the adversary can determine uh, when messages arrive at honest parties. The diff it can send different honest parties messages in different orders, including messages the honest parties send between themselves. So again, this is something that we, in you know, regular crypto, we usually like to assume these strong models, uh, but they are not always assumed in cryptocurrencies. And of course, you know, we can't just assume complete control over the network because then nothing works. So we do have a network guarantee, which is a bounded uh, time difference. So the network is synchronous in the sense that if any honest party uh, sends or receives the messages at time t, then all the other honest parties uh, will receive the message at time t plus delta for some known delta bound. Uh, so for us, you can think of delta as something like 30 seconds. OK. Second thing, we want to depend only on the contents of messages. Um, and in particular, we don't want to depend on the order in which we received messages or the timing when we receive the messages. And the reason we want to do this is to solve this sort of a sleeping beauty problem, right? If, uh, if somebody wakes up after 50 years and you know, goes on the internet and says, okay, what's the current state of the system? Then we don't want them to have to trust that they've managed to find an honest majority now. Right? They, they want to be able to get the, the content. Somebody gives them a proof, and they say, ah, OK, this is the, the state of the system. And this only works if you can depend only on the contents, because you cannot prove the timing of the messages uh, if somebody hasn't actually been there to receive the messages at this time. So of course, again, this is not uh, completely. You can't connect to just dishonest uh, neighbors and, and expect to get the right system, but uh, this way, you need only one honest neighbor, not an honest majority of neighbors. And uh, finally, we want to be robust to failures. So you have to plan for things to fail, because things will eventually fail, which means you need your system to be able to recover after a failure. Um, and moreover, you don't want this recovery to require manual intervention. So if, if your recovery plan is, well, you know, the developers will get together and will think of how to solve it, then this is a problem. The whole point of a cryptocurrency is that you don't have this small group of people that you trust to do the right thing, right? So you want the system to be able to recover by itself. Um, so in our case, we, we call this uh, self-healing, right? So after our assumptions are broken, right, there's no honest majority, something bad, really, really bad happens, um, then we want the system to be able to heal itself and get back to consensus. Obviously, we can't heal everything, right? If there's an arbitrary uh, violation of our assumptions, then maybe the adversary can rewrite history in some way. But the very least we can require is that, you know, once everything is done, then things will go back to normal. And of course, we also want, you know, making really bad changes, like changing old history, to be more expensive than making, um, you know, changing just recent history. Um, so in our case, the self-healing will require you know, some additional assumptions. So if, if something really, really bad happened, then in order to recover, we might need a period when the attacks are still ongoing, but maybe with less of a fraction of the, of the resources than we can tolerate in a normal operation. 
Okay. Um, so we talked about um, incentive compatibility. What we want this protocol to satisfy is that there are no races. Basically, we want honest behavior to always be rewarded no matter what the adversary does, obviously within you know, our uh, assumption. Right? If the adversary has a dishonest majority, we can't guarantee anything. Um, and the, the nice thing, once you show this is true, once you show that you know, your, your behavior, your honest behavior is always rewarded, then basically the flip side of this is you're showing that you can't gain anything by uh, doing bad things because the sum of the rewards is basically constant. So if nobody can lose, if they behave honestly, then nobody can gain by behaving dishonestly. Um, and again, in terms of provable security, we might, uh, or we actually do prove that this uh, race freeness uh, happens with a slightly stricter bound on the adversary's power than you know, the regular security. Okay, so how do we get all these nice things? Um, this is where the tortoise and the hare come in. So the core concepts of the protocol. First, we're going to, instead of having one block every 10 minutes, we're going to have a layer of blocks. So think of a layer as starting every five minutes. And in each layer, uh, there are going to be something like, uh, say, 200 blocks. So we're having many blocks every layer. And uh, in every layer, the blocks are published simultaneously or concurrently, so they don't have exactly the same time, but more or less at the same time. And each block says which layer it's in. So the blocks in layer one say, I'm in layer one. Blocks in layer two say, I'm in layer two, and so forth. Um, and we also divide these layers into epochs. So every two weeks, Every 4,000 and something layers is an epoch. I'll, I'll say why in a second. And now, uh, in order to show that we are allowed to participate, we're going to use this proof of space time. So we're going to use our disk space to generate a proof of space time. And then we're going to create what we call an activation transaction. Uh, basically, this is the proof that we've used our disk space. We, we've uh, expended the resource that we're supposed to have expended, so we should be able to generate blocks. So one thing that's, I think, interesting and different about this protocol is this proof is deterministic. We don't have a lottery that you, know, you do yourself and, and generate with some probability that depends on your resources. If you've expended your space time, you generate a proof. Um, and once you've generated a proof, you're guaranteed to generate blocks. So if you generate a proof in this epoch, you are guaranteed to generate uh, blocks in the next epoch. You might think, uh, well, OK, this is uh, very nice, but how do we uh, maintain the communication complexity? Right? The whole point of doing these sampling with the lottery is we want the communication complexity to remain constant even if uh, the number of miners, the number of users grows. So what we do here is instead of uh, sampling, we just increase the epoch size, right? So basically, everybody is going to publish one proof in every epoch. And if we have more and more miners, then we can make the epoch larger, so the time between proofs gets larger. This also happens, of course, if you sample, but now it's deterministic, and we can still keep the communication complexity uh, constant. Um, OK, so you've uh, created your proof, you generated uh, the, the proof that you're eligible to, to create a block. Uh, and now, in terms of rewards, basically, because the proofs are deterministic, your reward is guaranteed. It depends only on the resource uh, you expend, and we divide it um, in the, between the, the blocks the, that uh, are generated in each epoch. OK, so now what do we need to do? The, the nice thing about a chain, and it's very, very clear what the order of blocks in the chain is. Right? The, they're a chain. But if we have a DAG, it's not clear what the order is. So we have some basically arbitrary rule for deciding a total order of blocks in this, uh, this mesh. So one possibility is you take, uh, well, you have to take the layers. So you know, the, the high level, if you're in layer one and somebody's in layer two, then layer one comes, all the blocks in layer one come before all the blocks in layer two. But within a layer, we can say, just order them by hash, or by lexicographic thing, or do some other thing. But 
there, there's some specific rule that's you know, hard-coded and everybody agrees. So this will give us, once we know which blocks should be in the mesh, then we also know a total order of blocks. But of course, the problem is that honest parties don't agree on the timing of blocks. Right? The adversary is in full control of the network timing, and so uh, some honest parties might receive blocks earlier than others, and we can't accept blocks that are very late or very early. Um, why? Because if you have, for example, suppose we, we would accept a block that's very, very late, then suddenly, you know, three weeks after a layer was originally published, I add a block. Right? This clearly cannot be, because now I've changed history three weeks ago. So there has to be some cutoff. And for similar reasons, we can't you know, pretend that we're putting blocks in the future. Um, so how do we agree? Right? You know, the, the, we can say, if it's three weeks late, everybody will easily agree. But there's always, no matter where we choose the threshold, the adversary can always sort of put things right on the threshold. So how do we agree which, which blocks are uh, valid? We vote. So we can think of a, of a blockchain already as a kind of vote, right? A, every block votes for the chain that it thinks is the right chain at the time. So we're generalizing this. Every block votes um, for all the previous blocks and, think, and, and says basically whether it thinks they're valid or not. And now we just count the votes. So we sum up the votes and the majority wins. Right? So because the majority of the blocks are honestly generated, because the majority of the, of the uh, resource is controlled by honest parties, then the majority will always get the right thing. Right? So uh, we'll get consensus. When all the honest blocks vote in the same way, they'll be in the majority, and so they will all agree what is the majority, and everything will be great. And because new blocks are going to vote according to this majority rule, then we get the same type of irreversibility as Bitcoin. Right? There's this sort of uh, race, not, not a race in terms of the, when you publish a block, but if, if you're, the adversary is trying to reverse history, it needs to generate more votes than the honest parties, but they generate votes at a faster pace. And here, I count all the time. Uh, yes, yeah, so, okay, so th that's a good point. So uh, the votes that I count and the votes that actually belong to the mesh um, have different uh, conditions. So if something belongs to the mesh, if it's part of history, it needs to satisfy this uh, a majority of, of uh, votes voted for it. But in order to count a vote, all I need is a valid resource proof. I don't need it to be a valid part of history to count its vote. Uh, and th this actually solves the circularity problem. Um, OK, so this is what we call the tortoise protocol. The tortoise protocol is basically just a voting protocol. We vote, and it's, you know, it's slow and steady. And uh, well, there's an asterisk here. There's something I haven't told you about yet. Um, but basically, this will give us this Bitcoin type of irreversibility. Um, OK, so in a nutshell, right, if everybody agrees on which blocks are honest, uh, then they'll all, all the honest parties will vote the same way, and now we'll agree forever on which blocks are honest. And because we have many, many blocks in each layer, we actually get uh, this consensus much faster than we do in Bitcoin, right? Because it's 200 blocks every time instead of one block every time. OK, but the problem is that honest parties don't agree all the time on what are the blocks that uh, should be considered valid. Right? And then we don't have this initial condition that all the honest blocks vote together. So how do we solve this? Here's where we introduce the hair. So the hair protocol is this sub-protocol that is actually a Byzantine fault-tolerant agreement protocol Again, in a permissionless setting, but it's basically sort of a standard um, Byzantine agreement protocol. And what we do is we use this Byzantine agreement protocol to agree on the recent blocks. So on all the blocks that were just published, say in the previous layer, in the previous you know, three layers, we decide on their validity based on this Byzantine agreement protocol. And then we vote based on that. And for things that are older, we just count votes. So the, actually, the results of the hair protocol don't appear in our history. Right? The only thing that appears in the history are what I, the, the votes I actually cast. But to decide how I cast votes, I use the hair protocol. And because this uh, Byzantine agreement guarantees agreement, right, then even if the, the honest parties disagree, 
after they run this protocol, they're guaranteed to agree on the recent blocks, and so we get to the stage where the tortoise protocol will work well. And of course, there are very, very recent blocks which we haven't finished running this Byzantine agreement protocol on, so those we, we don't know yet, right? So blocks that have been just published in the previous layer and we haven't finished running the protocol yet, then, okay, we can't decide. They're not yet in our state. Okay, so that was, in a nutshell, the, the whole protocol. Um, but there are lots of, of things missing. So one thing is we've talked about getting a uh, complete order on blocks. But actually, um, when we talk about a cryptocurrency, we don't care about the blocks usually. We care about transactions. So how do we get a full order on transactions? So that actually turns out to be a pretty easy problem. right? We just get, once we have a full order on blocks, we look at the transactions within the blocks. And then we can say, just you know, take, uh, whoops take the transactions in order inside each block. Note that uh, unlike a chain, we can't guarantee there are no duplicate transactions, right? Because people are, are submitting these blocks simultaneously. So I don't know what's going to be in other blocks. But the way we solve this is we say, OK, everybody is going to choose a random subset of the possible transactions. So we don't have too much duplication. Basically, we, we get you know, a slight overhead. Um, and we can, once we have a full order, we can always say, look, if there are two different transactions, we always take the first one as the valid one. So it doesn't hurt in terms of security. And in terms of duplication, uh, the main cost in any case of the transaction, if there are complex transactions, is going to be something separate. We don't duplicate the entire transaction. We just need to duplicate a pointer. So it doesn't have a lot of overhead uh, in that sense. OK, so that was. Uh, uh, the protocol, I'll talk about a little bit what are the challenges when we do things like replacing these proofs of work with proofs of space time. So proofs of work are very expensive, but they have some really nice properties. And one of them is that the effort, the resource that I expend is actually bound intrinsically to my vote. Right? If I want to generate a different block with a proof of work, I have to do the whole work again. But the proofs of space-time that are based on storage, and actually this also holds for proofs of stake, they can't be bound to the vote. Because uh, the whole point is I don't want to redo everything. right? I want to use the same storage again and again to keep the costs low, the energy costs. So I am using the same storage for different votes, then it can't be bound to a specific vote. So we have this sort of nothing at stake problem. Second, the proofs of work are self-certifying. If I see a proof of work, then it's completely non-interactive. I can verify it, and that's it. But a proof of space-time requires storage over time, right? which means uh, I want to show that you've stored something for two weeks. I need to know that you started at some point in the past. And then uh, after two weeks, you give me a proof that you're still storing it. So there's this problem with uh, interactivity. right? We can, if, if it's just you know, a single proof, then I can't. Uh, I need to prevent somehow the fact that you simulate the, these past two weeks. So how do we deal with these problems? Well, for the nothing at stake problem, right? we bind our space to a specific identity. It's not bound to a vote, but it's bound to an identity. And creating a new identity is going to be costly. And that's actually going to be costly in work, in, in proof of work. So in general, uh, it's OK for it to cost work to generate an identity because you're going to use the same identity again and again, so the amortized work is going to be very low. But this allows us to say that you know, if there's an honest majority of resources, you can't, the, the adversary can't create too many identities. And now whenever you try to reuse, say, vote with two blocks that have the same identity and are in the same slot, this is easily identifiable. And so we can simply cancel your identity and force you to create a new one. So, it has a cost for you to do this. And then we don't need these extra kind of punishments that you uh, sometimes see in protocols like slashing or initial stake. Yes? Proofs of work, yes. So, it use, so, so the space time, in general, it's a resource that uh, you can switch between work and space. So you can decide to use work instead of space. Um, but it's rational to use space. It's actually much cheaper to use space. So yeah, our, our assumption is that this resource, it has an honest majority, but yeah. Um, OK, so 
our analysis uh, in terms of, of security relies, again, on the majority of, uh, I guess, space time and not storage. And because you can cancel old votes, right? If you had uh, old blocks and now I suddenly create uh, a new block that's sort of conflicting with a very old block, this will cause th the, this identity to be invalidated. So sort of lots of old votes might be canceled, but we can still deal with, we can still deal with this if we have a large enough honest majority, like uh, two thirds. Okay, what about this uh, problem uh, with interactivity? So here we introduce this uh, non-interactive proof of space time by combining a proof of space time with a proof of elapsed time, basically a proof of sequential work. So what happens is this uh, proof of space time uh, has two phases. It has a commit phase where we sort of initialize our storage and then it will have a challenge that should supposed to come, say, two weeks later to show that you're still storing stuff. So what we do is we use this commit as the challenge to a proof of sequential work, a proof of elapsed time. And then we use the proof of elapsed time that two weeks have passed as the challenge to the next phase of the proof of, uh, of space time. And this gives us basically a non-interactive proof that is self-certifying under the assumption, of course, that our proof of sequential work actually requires this amount of time. Um, and one thing to note here is that we don't require uniqueness in any of this. So uh, we, we don't need uniqueness to prevent grinding. So we can use things like uh, the uh, last year's uh, simple proofs of sequential work that's a very nice random oracle-based construction. And we have a much wider range of possible proof of uh, space time constructions uh, because we don't require the uniqueness property, only the property that you've proven that you've uh, used the resource. Okay, uh, so I think we don't have time for more, so I'm just going to list very briefly what I didn't tell you about. Um, so one thing is the way I described the tortoise protocol, it's like n cubed, the complexity, if, or maybe even more, it's, it's really horrible. So um, actually we can do something much, much better. We don't need to explicitly vote for all the blocks. Uh, we can use sort of this implicit computation and we have this optimizations that let you do it uh, much, much faster. Um, we also don't need to vote for uh, all the blocks, right? Because uh, old enough blocks are irreversible so we can have this sort of sliding window where we can uh, assume that because blocks that are far enough in the past are okay, we don't need to compute them again. Um, I also didn't tell you how we do self-healing, which is an important part here. Um, basically, the tortoise protocol has an extra part where even if there's no hair protocol at all, it can still guarantee consensus, it just takes longer. So it does this kind of uh, coin flipping um, using basically ideas from sort of traditional Byzantine agreement protocols. And over you know, enough layers, everybody w is guaranteed to agree. So even if our, thing, our, our system breaks down, uh, once that the assumptions uh, resume, then the tortoise protocol will guarantee that we'll get consensus. And once we have consensus, then our hair protocol will start working again, so we sort of automatically get back to a good state. Um, there are also questions of sampling. So I said that we don't sample things, things are deterministic. That's not quite true. It's true that you're guaranteed to generate blocks, but exactly where you generate the blocks is randomized. So there are some sampling problems. And of course, they didn't tell you anything about how the hair protocol works or the incentive structure or anything about the security proofs. Um, for that, uh, you'll have to read the paper, which will hopefully come out very soon. Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, one quick question, yeah. Button. Um, so, uh, when it comes to uh, your mechanism for ID management, um, you said that uh, you prevent people from multi multi voting multiple times by, by having them lose their identity when yes. that's detected. But on the other hand, the, uh, the, the flip side is that in order to achieve consensus, usually you have to have the honest majority come in to consensus, and that usually requires people to change their votes in order to, to achieve an honest 
majority vote on, on some, okay, something. Okay, so, so your vote isn't bound to your identity. You have a vote per identity per time slot, right? So I it's true. You, uh, over time, you change your votes about previous things, but you, you, your old votes are still sort of supposed to be irreversibly in stone, right? You, just like in a blockchain, right, over time, if you see a longer chain, you can switch and create new blocks pointing to the longer chain, exactly. but your old blocks are still there. You, you shouldn't be able to erase your old block from a chain. Okay, thanks. All right, with that, we run out of time. So uh, let's thank all the speakers again. Uh, next on the program, exciting coffee break upstairs. <laughs>